How excellent is thy name in all the earth. Praise the Lord for the ministry of music, the ministry of prayer, the ministry of presence, the ministry of the written and spoken word through scripture. This morning, welcome to the house of the Lord on this beautiful, bright, but yet chilly day. Good to see everyone. And because I can't see those online, we're glad you're there. And we pray that as you hear the word of the Lord this morning, that you will hear not me, but the risen Christ through me by the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, as I reflect upon 2021, I think about how excellent God is. Excellent that He is a protector. He is a provider. He's the one that gives us sweet rest at night. The one who holds us in the palm of His righteous hand. In spite of COVID, God is still on the throne has never left and ever lived to make intercession for each of us. So what a blessing. This morning, as we dwell into God's word, a little bit different, I don't have the traditional introduction, but however, I do believe that Every now and then, each one of us loves a good TV program or a good movie, a good play. So this morning, we're going to look at the story of Naaman, 2 Kings chapter 5 and, five and all the verses that are included. But as in any good play and any good movie, normally when the credits are run, they give you an introduction of who's who and what the theme of the particular show is all about. So this morning, the subtopic topic for our story about naming this morning will be all is well. Lessons from the life of Naaman, a captive servant girl, a faithful prophet, Elijah, and an unfaithful, unfaithful servant named Jehazi. Naaman, principal star of this particular Call it a seven-part scenario with a pre with a postlude. We have Naaman, whose name means beautiful, agreeable, pleasant, commander of the Syrian army. King Aram, Armenian Syrian king, possibly Benadad II. We have a little servant girl, captive and servant to Naaman's wife, unnamed but yet recognized. We have Naaman's wife, unnamed, unrecognized. She listens to wisdom, not afraid to share wisdom with her husband. Then you have Joram, whose name means Yah is exalted, the Lord exalts, king of Israel at this time, fearful but yet weak. Then we have Elijah, prophet of God in Israel. His name means Yahweh is my God. He's a man of God. Unlike the rest of the characters in this story, he has other credits. In 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, he asked the poor widow to borrow vessels and jars for the outpouring of all for their needs. In 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7, Elijah, by God's power, causes the axe head to float. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah, under the power of the Holy Spirit, defeats the prophets of Baal at Montcalm. Then we have the messenger, a servant of Elijah, unnamed, but he has a strange message for Naaman. Then we have Naaman's officers. I call them persistent encouragers. Then we have Jehazi. His name means valley of vision and sight. He was Elijah's personal servant, deceived, distracted, and disobedient. So this morning, as we look at this scenario, of all is well, shall we pray. God of heaven, 
Your word is true. It is powerful and holy. Father God, nothing I've done to deserve the opportunity to speak your holy word. But Father, I thank you, Lord, for allowing this word to marinate in my heart and my spirit this week. And Father God, now may your people taste and see that the Lord, he is good. May they feast on your word today, knowing that the God of heaven is in control of your word. Father, bless our hearts and our minds to receive Christ and him crucified. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Majority of this message will be taken from 2 Kings chapter 5 and from the New Living Translation. Scene number one, Naaman has a dreaded disease called leprosy. 2 Kings 5, 1 says the king of Aram, of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. The New King James Version said he was a man of valor. In Leviticus 13 is a description of what leprosy looks like. Verses 1 through 3 says it is a swelling scab with a bright spot which was turned, uh, turned white and eaten into the flesh. Verse 8 says a swelling scab with a bright spot which was turned white and eaten into the flesh. Verse 18 of Leviticus 13 says it's a sore described as a bowl. In verses 42 through 42, uh, 42 through 44 causes hair to fall out. Mercy. In verses 47 through 52, it is contagious, highly infectious. And in verses 4, 5, 21, 26, 31, and 32, a person had to go into isolation or quarantine, living alone. Now, as we look at this, Naaman, man of valor, his, his king praises his efforts. His king likes what he's doing for the army of the Armenians, and he had many victories in the name of Syria. But we see that in it all, the key point in this first scene, but yet Naaman had leprosy. Yeah. I want you to understand in the commentary that leprosy is not to the point that is requiring him to be quarantined, but left unchecked, it can lead to death. But out of all of that, I want us to remember that God certainly will use the circumstances of our lives to create a need for him. Yeah. Scene two, Naaman's wife's servant girl. At this time, Armenian raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. Now, youth often is frowned upon in today's society as if young people don't know anything. The last time I checked in this story, this was a young girl that was poised and positioned for the purpose of God as she served in a foreign land. So don't allow your youth to prevent you from being paused and in position for the purpose that God has in your life. She did not uh, allow her youth to prevent her from speaking truth. She simply said, one day she said to her mistress, one day the girl said to her mistress, perhaps uh, that she wished that her, her master would go down and see the prophet in Israel. She was faithful to God in the midst of her circumstances did not hesitate to demonstrate the compassion of Christ in a Christless surroundings. Although unnamed, she did not go unnoticed. Often in life, I was growing up and was told, uh, just be uh, quiet and unseen. But often in life, when there's a word that God has placed on your heart, he simply says, speak the word. Don't worry about whether you're noticed or not. Speak the word. She was a slave girl uh, from her home. This little maid was nevertheless one of God's witnesses, unconsciously fulfilling the purpose of which God had chosen Israel as his people. 
the conduct of the captain maid, the way she bore herself in that heathen home is a strong witness to the power of early home training. There's no higher trust than the committed to fathers and mothers in the care of training their children. Parents have to do with the very foundation of the habit and character. By their example in teaching, the future of their children is largely decided. Parents who impart to, ch to the child such a gift have endowed him or her with a treasure far more precious than the wealth of all the ages, a treasure enduring as eternity. Prophet and Kings, page 245. Amen. Scene number three. Naaman approaches his king. As we, as we transition, Naaman is receiving or hearing a servant girl's wisdom. We aren't sure if he heard her counsel directly from her or indirectly from the mouth of his wife. Wisdom from God first or second hand is still God's wisdom. In verse 4, Naaman told the king when the young girl from Israel had said, go and uh, visit the prophet, the king of Aram, of Aram told him, I will send a letter of introduction for you to take the king to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying as gift 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter, I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of leprosy. Now, in this process, we see Naaman took the time to go to his commander, to talk to the king, to ask for permission to go to even see the king of Israel. Now, the reason being, Syria, uh, the Armenian people, were constantly at war in Israel in border wars at this time. So you imagine you have a, a uh, ceasefire going on, and you see that there's no skirmishes going on, but yet this king of uh, Assyria gives permission for him to go to see the king of Israel, who is his arch enemy. And so he allows this to happen. But I want you to understand that people in high positions might hold the key to some of God's blessings in your life. Don't be afraid to ask leadership for what you want. Your blessings might be within someone else's hands. And above all else, don't surrender your destiny to your problem. So often we allow our problems to determine our destiny. Don't let your problems determine how you live for Christ. The king sent a letter of introduction to the king of Israel and said, this is my servant Naaman. The question is, what does your letter of introduction reveal? Does it say it's faithful or faithless? Fruitful or fruitless? Servant or selfish? What does your letter of introduction say? It's interesting that Naaman went to this king with a whole lot of money and some fancy clothes. I want you to know that the, your money and your position can't purchase your healing. That's right. So an estimation from the commentators, one said that this value was $1.2 million, which I believe is a little excessive. But nevertheless, the other commentators say it was about $70,000 worth of stuff. We spent our money going to hospitals. And they do have that purpose. Don't get me wrong. Modern medicine has its place. Modern medicine has done wonderful things. But I want to let you know, modern medicine can do a lot of things, but it can't heal you. No, I. And can you imagine, here's a king of Israel that's supposed to know the true and living God. He gets a word from the king of another heathen nation that says to him, here's my servant, Naaman, I want you to heal him of leprosy. Now you would figure that the king of Israel knew the God of Israel. But in context, he is frightened and he tears his clothes and he is fretful and says, this guy must be trying to set me up for another skirmish and another quarrel. That's all he's concerned about. And 
fortunately right that as he goes to this, Elijah is listening. But before we get there, the turn of the clothes is an act of distress or sorrow resulting from fear. And in it, he had the question asked, he said to himself, am I God? This is the king of uh, Syria. And we come to the point in our lives that sometimes we need to recognize our spiritual calling or condition. Now, it's, good, it's sad that the king didn't know God. But yet he knew he didn't know God. And so he took his time and he's, he needs to be thankful that Elijah heard what was going on. Positions of power don't always mean we are empowered by God. God alone holds life and death in his hands. As knowledge God is the source of all healing and relinquishes all human efforts to, uh, to the power of God. And the king of Syria had a suspicion. He didn't take the genuineness of the letter from the king of Israel that all he wanted to do is help get this man healed. He was worried about what he's trying to start a fight. So in Christianity, the lesson that I learned from this take is this. Don't be suspicious, so suspicious of people in the world or in the church because sometimes those folks have the key to your blessing. Don't be at all surprised. We'll look at scene number four. Oh, before we get there, just one key point. I want to let you know, Naaman's pedigree, prestige, and position and power prevented him from seeing his need of humility before God. So we want to let you know that all of this, excuse me, scene four, when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent his message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me and he will learn that there is a true prophet in Israel. Now, God placed Elijah in Israel to be a mouthpiece for God in such precarious times. And the idea that the king of uh, Syria didn't understand this, we pretty much get because he wasn't that connected to God. But yet he says to the king of Israel, who should have known God, send him to the true prophet. You don't know what you're doing, send him to me. Okay? So in verse, um, in scene five, Naaman went with horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah's house, waiting at the house of Elijah. Sometimes we as Christians, and Lord knows I'm in that boat, waiting is a problem. Waiting is a problem. One of my favorite lines is, you know, you see in banks, if you had direct deposit, you wouldn't be waiting in this line. But yet, in order to get your money out of the bank, you still got to go and get money out in line. Traffic in Chattanooga, we have to wait, don't we? We have to wait on a lot of things. We have to wait to eat sometimes. Anybody ever been hangry? Yeah. Okay. Our position in life does, does not presuppose that we have favor with God and can always receive preferential treatment from God. Now, in verse 10, Elijah sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of leprosy. Now, the last time I checked around Chattanooga, there's a lot of water. Tennessee River, Chattanooga Creek, or whatever you call it. Uh, all those things, and I've looked at them right there, not so clean. And so, in the context of this story, we see that it is recommended that he goes to the Jordan River and dip himself seven times. Uh, the idea really repulsed um, Naaman. To the point in verse 11 it says Naaman became angry and stalked away. Basically he was saying right who me? Go down to the Jordan River? That dirty place? 
No, not me. And so as it went forward, in verse 10 it says, Naaman became Naaman and walked and stalked away. I thought I would certainly come, he would come out to me. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God to heal me. Are the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Parfo better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in rage. Now, according to the commentary, the, the Abana and the Parfo were much more prestigious and much cleaner than the Jordan River. They were wider, they were bigger, they had more life around the, the river. But Naaman said, hey, listen, I got a better river than this back home. Just send me home. But God said to him, if you want to be healed, go down to the Jordan River. Yeah. Have we ever found ourselves angry with God and running away from God and his blessings? Well. When God's blessings don't happen when, where, and how, and who we expect them to come through, we have inordinate expectations sometimes. Isn't modern healing ministry somewhat like what Naaman expected? Wave your hand in the air and let the sores and the diseases of my life and let the sin of my life be gone because I can come to you and give you a little something, a little money on the side, sin for my prayer cloth, sin for whatever right in my life is better. That's not how God works. He didn't work that way then, and he does not work that way now. And so we go to scene number six, Voices of Reason. The Word of God teaches in Isaiah 1, 18, come, let us reason together. And I'm so glad that in this story that there were servants of Naaman who had more sense than he did. And uh, verse 13, it says, but the officers tried to reason with him and said, sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down in the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child and was healed. Sometimes God uses different situations and difficult situations and circumstances and even people to bring your blessing. That's right. That's right. It was a simple thing to go down into the Jordan River and to dip seven times. And I recognize I'm meddling, but I'm on meddle anyway. Sometimes God has said to us and for the larger population at whole that wearing a mask might be the blessing to your health. Amen. Just might be. Just saying. Okay? Just saying. So simple things can be a blessing. Go wash and be cured. Why seven times? And I often wonder that myself. The idea of perfection. Naaman had to dip himself in the water seven times. Why not th three or five? Seven is the number that symbolizes perfection. He was going to be perfectly and completely healed. In Leviticus 4, 6, we read that God, uh, we read about a very solemn ceremony that took place in the temple. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. Every time a sinner bought an animal to be sac sacrificed, the priest had to perform this rite with the blood of, of the victim. Our salvation is not sometimes simple, but a process that has seven stages, namely acknowledgement of our sins, repentance, sorrow for our sins under the influence of the Holy Spirit, confession, telling God what, we, what he already knows about us, every detail, coming clean with God. Number four, justification, forgiveness. Number five, reconciliation, rest restoration of the relationship between man and God. Sanctification, the process of being uh, cleansed from sin. 
and the power to overcome sin in our lives. And lastly, redemption, glorification, when the image of God will be restored in us and we shall be in his glory, in his holy presence. Let's turn to Psalms 51. to verify and to see how God works in the lives of his people. Story of David. And we know the background of David and how he has sinned against God against Bathsheba and Uriah. And the word of the Lord says, Have mercy upon me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me from my guilt. Purify me from my sins. For I recognize my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned and have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born as a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be white as snow. Oh, give me back my joy again and you have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a loyal or right spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And so in life, Naaman didn't recognize it at the time, but we as Christians, as we've grown in the Lord, we recognize that we too might need to have a Jordan experience. We too need a place that we don't expect to go and find relief and salvation and hope and joy in Christ. We too may have to go to a strange place, receive a strange message from a strange person to go to a place that we never intended to go just to get blessed by God. He's still a healer. And as we continue to look at the story of Naaman, I'm going to say this to the last scene seven. Naaman and his attendants say to say, uh, re- Excuse me, Naaman and his attendants returned to say thanks. Then Naaman, in verse 15, then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel, so please accept a gift from your servants. So often in today's society, The word thanks or thank you seems to be a foreign word. We celebrate Thanksgiving once a year. In the other 364, we act like the word thank you is not necessary. The word of the Lord says in everything, give thanks. Everything. Life may not be going your way. Thank God that you have life may not be living where you want to live. Praise God that you're living. And everything give God thanks. It is important that in the confession of faith that we thank the man of God, which Naaman was going to do in the presence of Elijah and in the presence of God. He came to the point that he recognized that through his experience, there was no other God in all the world None like you besides in Israel. Naaman now wanted to present before Elijah all that he had bought. The 750 pounds of silver, the 150 pounds of gold, the 10 changes of clothes. He said, let let me give you something. Done a marvelous job. I went down to the river. I obeyed you, you know, and now I'm clean. So let me break you off. Let me give you some money. But Elijah refused. And Elijah, a man of God, came to the point of understanding you can't accept credit for what God has and is doing in your life. 
No amount of money can ever replay what God is doing through His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Salvation can't be purchased online. You can't get it at eBay. You can't get it at Amazon. You can only get it on your knees through the power of Jesus Christ. And verse 17 says, Then Naaman said, All right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. From now on, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifice to any other god except the Lord. Two mules with earth from this place. What a strange request. Naaman believed, and he desired to be in God's presence. And he believed that taking part of Israel with him was necessary to always be in the presence of God. Ain't it good? Isn't it nice that the presence of God, though it dwells at OPC, is, the only, is not the only place that the presence of God dwells? Isn't it nice to know that you can fall on your knees anywhere, any place, any time, and call on the Most High God? Isn't it nice that you can have an altar in your home, an altar at your bedside? You can have an altar in your car. You can have an altar at your job. Just praise Jesus where you are. The Word of God teaches in Galatians 3.29, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You don't have to be in the literal country of Israel to praise the God of Israel. Verse 18, however, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. When my master, the king, goes into the temple of God, Raymond, to worship there and leans on my arm, may the Lord pardon me and I bow, when I bow too. Naaman had been converted, but he had this problem back at home. He still had a job to do. He still had to go back to Syria. He still had to be in the presence of his king, and he was his king's assistant. And so he asked for pardon in advance. Listen, I'm not worshiping God. I'm simply having my master to kneel down. And Elijah's response, go in peace, wishing him health, prosperity, salvation, and well-being. Now, as we, I got to skip one, sorry. Yes, scene eight. This is the postlude. The idea of Naaman having been converted and given his heart to the Lord, seeking to pay for his salvation, understanding that he couldn't, recognizing that he wanted to be in the presence of God is where God would have us to be. Yes. Now, however, in the postlude, scene number eight, the greed of Jehazi. Verse 20. But Jehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said to himself, My master should have let this Armenian get, should not have let this Armenian get away from without accepting any of his gift. As I, excuse me, as surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something for him. So Jehazi set out after Naaman. Jehazi had a covetous spirit. In Exodus 20, 17, and Deuteronomy 5, 21, the Lord tells us we shall not covet. Stop trying to get somebody else's stuff. Chasing someone or something to receive earthly rewards and treasures is not God's design for our lives. Chasing after to get something. So often in life, before knowing Christ, the idea that we as human beings, self-included, we chased, out of a lot of, chased after a lot of things that had no value but only for our own self-gratification. Yes, well. My counsel and my prayer for each of us is that we beware of who and what and how we are chasing after stuff, Amen. people, places, and things, because they cannot save not one of us. Be careful what we're chasing after. 
the songwriter wants us to know anyhow, he's chasing after you. He's chasing after me. He puts out an APB on our souls each and every day of our lives. Then it talks about when Naaman and Je uh, saw Jehazi running after him in verse 21, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right in the New Living Translation? And Naaman, uh, Naaman, Naaman asked. And the King James Version said, is all well. Today, is everything all right with you and your God? Is all well with your soul? Things might look good or bad, but is all well. In this crazy time of COVID, and it's been crazy and brutal, it's been of the highest level of grief I've ever seen or experienced in my life, and you as well. Tearing apart, tearing apart families, tearing apart communities, literally tearing apart a nation. But the question is, in the midst of all that is going on, is all well? Is it well in your household? Is it well in your heart? Is it well in your mind? Is it well with your God? We don't have to wait till we lie down in our eternal rest to say it is well with our soul. Amen. We can be well with Jesus right now. Because peace like a river attendeth your way. Is it well? Verse 22, Jehazi said, but my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give to them. Mercy. Jehazi's first lie. In reality, all is not well. He disguised, put it this way. Elijah never told him to go tell anybody anything. He took it upon himself in his own covetous heart to chase after, after uh, Naaman to get something for nothing that he didn't even really have a part in. But yet he chases him, tells a lie about it, then he has the audacity to implement Elijah and say, my master say. You know how we do as children, sometimes my mama said, and mama ain't said nothing, and my daddy said. And so the idea is this. Understand that in how sin works, sin requires that all of a sudden, if you tell one lie in order to prop it up, you got to dress it up with another. Witness our current political scene. Enough said. In verse 23, we see that Naaman openly and generously gives Jehazi what he asked for. But Jehazi, in verse 24, says, but when they arrived at the citadel, meaning the fortress back where uh, Elijah and the rest of the servants lived, Jehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. Then he went and hid the gifts from inside the house. So help me out. If you bless the God and you're not telling a lie and the, the foreign gentleman from another country has blessed you with these goods for what you call the purpose of serving and blessing two of the servants that are going to help you in the service of God, why in the world do you need to hide God's blessings? So, God teaches us that we do our arms, we do them in secretly, and he reward us openly. So, Jehazi turns around and he hides the stuff on the way to the house. In verse 25, he gets to the point, he says, he went into the master. Elijah asked him, where have you been? Second lie. I haven't been anywhere. So he attempts to address up his first mistake with another mistake. 
He had a divine opportunity to confess right there. But he chose to cover it up with another lot. Word of the Lord teaches that be sure that your sins will find you out. Essentially, Jehazi sealed his destination through disobedience. We have the opportunity to seal our destination through obedience. We can choose the temporal or the eternal. In verse 26, but Elijah asked him, don't you realize I was there in spirit when Naaman stopped down, stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Is this time to receive money and clothing and olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle and male and female servants? Word of the Lord says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Praise God for his discernment because he called Elijah out. In the day's modern uh, society, people are steadily come to the point that we'll tell, we'll make the truth a lie and a lie a truth. In the church, out of the church, all around, we will tell a lie and say, let's camouflage that lie so people won't recognize it. Got news for you. You put camouflage in the wash long enough, it'll fade and it'll reveal what's underneath. And then Elijah asked him, said, is this the time for you to be gathering all these things? So God's question to each of us today, is this the right time? What time is it in your life? Is it a time to gather things or is it a time to bow down before our maker and our creator? As we see the world unfolding before us, we see prophecy unfolding before us. We see these United States acting up like the word of God says that it would in, in Revelation 13 and the great controversy. We see all these things. So is it time together? Is it a time to bow? I suggest to us it's time to bow. And lastly, in verse 27, God wants us to recognize in this postlude, this last scene of Naaman's life and also the uh, life of Jehazi, that there are immediate and generational consequences for sin. Because, we have done, because you have done this, in verse 27, you and descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Jehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was white as snow. The word of the Lord teaches us that, that if we aren't careful, that the sins of the mothers and fathers shall be visited unto the children to the third and fourth generation. But he would show mercy unto thousands that love him and keep his commandments. So God wants us to understand that in obedience there is eternity. In disobedience there is the temporary. We have nothing to look for but what's down here on earth. So God wants us to look up and recognize that his redemption draweth nigh. What time is it? Jesus is coming soon. That's what time it is. The question is, is it well with you and your household? Is it well in your soul? And so as the musicians come, is it well? Is it well? Is it well? And only you and the Holy Spirit can answer that question. People may look at us from the outside looking in, but God looks at us from the inside looking out. So in conclusion, this brief scenario of life written by the Holy Spirit or produced by the Holy Spirit, directed by God the Father, written by holy men as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So this morning or this afternoon, Naaman came to understand that when God wants seven, six won't do. So in our lives this morning, as we think about the goodness of the Lord, young folk put it this way, is it all right? 
is it well? So my prayer for each of us this morning as we contemplate our lives. Do we need to be praying about that Jordan experience that we need? Do we need to be praying about that place where we need to be washed and clean? My late grandmother put it this way. It's going to come out in the wash, dirty or clean. So this morning, our prayer, my prayer for each of us, that we would be among the blood-washed number in the hands of Jesus Christ. Recognize that we had an opportunity to go down into the Jordan. I don't care if it took 12 times. Jesus, wash me and make me clean. Let's pray this morning. Father, as we look at your word, we see that there's a God of heaven who beckons us. And he will use the circumstances of our lives to create a need for him. May we sense our great need for you, Father. May we sense our great need for Jesus Christ, the source of our salvation. May we sense our great need for the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. May we sense our great need for the one who said he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May we sense that we need to go to that quiet place in our hearts and our minds that special location, our Jordan River, to find Christ and bow before him. May we recognize that there's no earthly thing that we can pay for our salvation, that we can only trust you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God, may we recognize, Lord, that if we aren't careful, we'll leave a generation of curses and sins upon our children unless the Holy Spirit intercedes. Intercede, dear Holy Spirit. Intercede. Intercede in each family, in each individual, in each heart. Intercede, O oh Father God, that we won't need the things of this world to satisfy our heart. We only need you. Intercede, dear Father. And Father God, as we Go to the our Jordan experience. May we come up shouting, leaning on the Lord, and say, Lord, I've seen and I know my change. Thank you, Father, for blessing us today in your presence and your power. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless each other.